Next question is, with all the talk of 14 nanometer of Intel being done, but still being competitive until the last six months, do you think AMD should be worried what will happen when, not if, uh, Intel gets their 10 nanometer or even seven nanometer working from a performance perspective? I get where this question is coming from because obviously you would expect a performance improvement moving to a newer node. So if they've been able to do as well as they have been on 14 nanometer, then, you know, potentially as soon as they get that nice little upgrade and boost, then, you know, that could send AMD into a bit of strife. But at the same time, the 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer designs that we had were based on, you know, the performance upgrade that you get versus 14 nanometer from several iterations before. Like, it's only in the most recent iterations that we've had 14 nanometer CPUs do like 5 gigahertz. Mm -hmm. Like, if you, if you look back at KB Lake or something like that, which was, what, the second 14 nanometer CPU or even the third generation or something along those lines, yeah, they weren't hitting that sort of frequency yet. So there's always a question when you move from one super, super refined node running at super high frequencies to a new node, can they get the frequencies that are required? So there's going to be the upgrade that they're getting from 14 nanometer to 10 nanometer has potentially shrunk over time as they've been able to get more and more out of that 14 nanometer node. So yeah, there's still a lot of questions there that I don't think AMD should be super worried. I mean, they've got node advancements coming up as well, being able to move to five nanometer, which shouldn't happen too far after Intel gets on 10 nanometer. So Also, when people make these arguments, which we've been seeing since the dawn of Ryzen, let's say, yeah, I don't take other factors into consideration, which we're starting to see play out now. So with Ryzen, Intel has been dominant with gaming performance. They yeah. haven't been dominant with productivity ever since Ryzen showed up. Even first generation Ryzen for core heavy productivity tasks was very competitive from yeah. the outset, despite the fact that it had, you know, much weaker DRAM latency, much weaker core to core latency for productivity tasks. It did really well and it's improved since then. Intel is really good in gaming because for the most part, their mainstream processors have had four cores. You know, we sort of, they tacked on to six and then eight, but they had for the most part, four cores in a very small die packed closely together very low latency because of that design. But when you want to scale that design up and add lots more cores, uh, which we're starting to see now, is that you know you can improve productivity performance. We're seeing like what 20 that's where the 20% yep. IPC claim was. But gaming performance stays about the same at best, or in some instances has gone backwards because you've increased stuff like core to core latency. And as those designs need to scale up what are we at, eight cores, you know, once they need to start doing 12 and 16 and more than that, then, you know, that they're the things they have to overcome. So the gains that they've had in games due to having four really fast cores that are very close together in a neat little, you know, monolithic package, that goes out the window. So they sort of have to go backwards before they can go forwards. Yeah, that's definitely all part of it, which is why I think, you know, a lot of people are already making claims about Alder Lake, for example, based on rumors about, Pick any high IPC gain number that you want to use, 20%, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever the rumor says. It's like we've talked about previously, doesn't necessarily mean that you're getting that in games. Could be anything, so, but that's right. And, and that's where Intel, you know, Intel may need 20% of an IPC gain plus more cores to match AMD, who is significantly ahead in productivity because they offer a 16 core processor. Mm -hmm. So that's where a lot of that stuff's going to be handy. But then, what if it's only 0% or 5% for gaming? Or what if performance actually goes backwards because IPC is the same, but they can't clock 10 nanometer at 5 gigahertz anymore and they can only hit 4.5 gigahertz yep. or something? So you start running into these issues where it's not just, it's not as simple anymore as saying, we're bringing a new CPU out on a new node and it's going to be better. Because it depends on the architecture, it depends on the clock speeds they can hit. Yeah. And the fact that 14 nanometer was able to clock so high, I think is going to cause some headaches. And already is, because if they were able to get 10 nanometer running at 5 gigahertz in outside of a mobile chip, then they would have not released this current 11th gen series. It would have been a 10 nanometer CPU. Mm -hmm. But the fact that whatever design they had at the time, it probably wasn't sufficient yep. for, for the gaming and tasks that they would have released that product for. Now, I see where, yeah, again, we see where you're coming from with this question, but it seems 
uh, not that clear now that if you said to Intel, you can use the TSMC 7 nanometer process, make a 16 core CPU that's as fast or faster than AMD's for productivity and gaming. I think that's a big ask. Like, I don't think that's something they can just do because they're Intel. Yeah. So I think that'd be very, very difficult for them to achieve. Anyway, we'll see how uh, stuff like this plays out moving forward. Obviously, we've got the 5950X benchmark there. That CPU is not going away now. (laughs) So we'll see uh, how long it takes before Intel can beat that for, you know, productivity and and gaming, I suppose, with, with a mainstream desktop processor.